Jake, how you doing today? I'm doing great, Billy. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. You know, we're going to talk through a lot of different things here, but I want to start with the fact that you are running for Senate in Arkansas. Let's just start with why. What was it that made you feel like this was the right move for you? Well, I think, first of all, Washington is broken. And, you know, I think many people in Arkansas understand, and obviously around the country, people understand that you know, the problem is coming from the Democrat Party, from the radical left, you know, Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and the squad. But also part of the problem, and this is crucial, are the do-nothing, invisible establishment rhinos in the Republican Party. We need real conservative warriors, true leaders who can stand up and lead from the front. And look, I'm, I'm not a career politician. Right? I come from a sports background. Uh, I come from a military background. And I'm doing this because I believe in this country. I believe in this state. The great state of Arkansas deserves great leaders. And that's why I'm in this race. So so you've described yourself as a God-fearing Christian conservative. So what, is, what does that mean to you? Well, that's a, it, it's, a, it's a deep question. Um, but to me, you know, everything, nothing is more important in my life than my faith. I was very blessed to be raised in a, a two-parent home where I was raised to fear the Lord. And, you know, I was just that that's, that there's no greater blessing than a young person can have. Um, and just everything starts to, to, with me from that foundation. Um, and, you know, I, I think people around the country, they're, they're craving a return to the faith-based values this country was founded upon. I mean, obviously, our, our founders spoke about it. They wrote about it extensively. They fought over it. And I, I think, you know, people of faith and even people who, you know, might have lapsed faith or people who have gotten away from the churches, you know, as, as our culture has drifted away from that, people still feel that that hole in their heart doesn't go away. They still feel that longing. And I think we need to have more leaders in Washington who are unafraid to stand up and speak the truth, who are unafraid to speak about the Christian values that this nation was founded upon. And who are unafraid to stand up and say, hey, we have to return to those values. And so that's, you know, when I say I'm a God-fearing Christian conservative, I mean that. That's coming from the heart. And it's something that I'm unafraid of. Yeah, you know, you think it, you think about where we are culturally. You look at, I mean, read the headlines, you know this. Culturally, we're in a crisis, right? And so as faith has sort of been stripped out of society, and this is regardless of politics or anything else, down on the baseline of all of what is happening, it's very easy to see if you draw a graph from you know society moving away from God and moving away from truth and where we are now, you can see that chaos really sort of correlating. And I want to talk about that a little bit more, get into your military um, experience. You've got a really fascinating background. We'll talk a little about the NFL. But I have to ask you, you know, sort of coming off of that question about faith, I would imagine, and I've never run for office before, I probably never will, but how challenging is it to hold on to those faith values, which are the core of who you are, while you're running for office? Those seem like really complex dynamics to sort of remedy. Well, it, it's true, you, but you've got to have that firm foundation in the faith. You've got to be standing on the rock because you know you're going to be attacked. You're going to be attacked from all sides. And unless you're on that firm foundation, right, and if your house is built upon sand, it's going to be washed away. And so really, I, I take it as a, you know, I, I feel called to be in this race. I feel that, you know, part of being in this race and this campaign is, is being obedient to, to God's calling and God's plan for my life. I know I've been called to lead. I've been called to serve. I think that's been reflected in my military service uh, and, and now in politics, because, you know, I truly believe it, as you intimated earlier, the, the real fight in this country, it's, it's not really on a distant battlefield right now. The fight is right here. It's domestic. It's, it's cultural. It's spiritual. And, and we need real leaders, you know, who can, who can restore the promise of this country. And that's what I'm here to do. God willing. So, so let's talk about your background. You obviously played in the NFL and I would imagine that was an amazing experience. What, what did you, what did you take away from that experience now that you've had time to sort of look back at it? It, it was an incredible blessing. I was, I was so fortunate. I never dreamed in a million years I'd have a chance to play professionally and play for a team, a, a dynasty like the New England Patriots. You know, my, my dream growing up was to follow in my grandfather, dad and uncle's footsteps and play football for the University of Arkansas. So accomplishing that goal was, I mean, that was really, I, I fulfilled everything 
that I believed I could do, um, you know, athletically. But really, later in my career at Arkansas, I, I kind of came to the realization that, hey, I have a chance to play professionally. I wanted to pursue football and play for as long as I could. And, you know, just to get that call from from Mr. Kraft, Robert Kraft, the owner of the Patriots, Coach Belichick, to say that I'd been drafted by the New England Patriots, it was just an incredible feeling. And then just to be a part of that organization, right, to learn – you know, just far beyond the X's and O's of being on a football team, I got to learn some of the greatest lessons of leadership you could possibly learn from some of the all-time greats, from people like Tom Brady, people like Coach Belichick, people like Matthew Slater, Gerard Mayo, Vince Wilfork, Nate Solder, you know, names that might not be household names, but people who were part of that organization, the Patriot way. And I carried those lessons with me into my military career as a platoon leader with the 101st Airborne and now into the Senate campaign. So, I mean, it, it's really a crazy story, you know, football, military, and it wasn't like military came first. You So you're done with the NFL, and then you decide you're going to join the Army. What what went into that decision for you? Again, I, I felt the call to serve. We had a – so Coach Belichick, a little backstory, he, he's a very strong supporter of the military. Um, his dad, Steve Belichick, actually coached at the Naval Academy. So Bill grew up in that environment around Annapolis. And so, you know, during the off seasons in New England, Bill would have, uh, you know, lots of, you know, decorated military veterans come and speak to the team, come and work with the team. Uh, we had a, a former Navy SEAL who came and worked with us on, on leadership and, uh, and that sort of thing. So I, I really, you know, being in that environment, really, I, I'd always, I've always loved this country. I've always been a student of history. I've always admired soldiers and statesmen who had military service as a part of their story. And, you know, I just felt the call and I realized that, hey, I'm going to play football for as long as I can. But when I when my career ended, I was still a relatively young and healthy man. I, I wanted to serve. I was willing and able to serve. And I just it, it was such a profound calling that I couldn't ignore it. And, and again, I go back to that word obedience. You know, I felt that to, to not serve would have been disobedient. And, you know, it was a, it was an amazing experience. It was difficult. It was a struggle, um, you know, but I wouldn't change a thing. Now you ended up actually being deployed to Iraq. Was it 2017 that you went there? Um, uh, 2019. Actually. 2019. Okay, and then you you came back. I believe it was September 11th of 2019. What what were you experiencing there? What did you see there? Yeah, so going to uh, deploying to Iraq with the 101st Airborne. First of all, it was an incredible honor to to deploy, uh, especially with such a storied unit, uh, the Screaming Eagle patch, you know, wearing that on my shoulder was, you know, it, it meant the world. I mean, everyone's seen Band of Brothers, you know, people people understand that patch. Um, and to be a part of that unit, I mean, to me, it's, um, you know, it, it's almost like being a part of, you know, the it's, it's the Army's version of the Patriots, I guess. You know, it's just a, it's a storied unit and it, it meant the world to be a part of that. And then being in Iraq, um, you know, that deployment really opened my eyes. You know, it doesn't take long being on the ground in a country like that to understand the the true nature of evil. You know, you, you see real, real violence, real poverty, real despair in a place like that that had been under the grips of ISIS, um, you know, terrorist attacks, you know, constantly happening in in northern Iraq and Kurdistan and Mosul, where we were, uh, where we were stationed. Um, and, and so it really, it, it was, it was an experience unlike any other because, you know, at that point we had been in Iraq for over 15 years. Uh, you know, we were still fighting some of the same battles, uh, the same enemies still in, you know, some of the same political struggles that we had been in over the past 15 years. Not a lot of things had really changed for the better. It was hard to make that argument. Um, we saw the influence of, of Iran with these uh, Shia militia groups. Uh, and the influence of the Ayatollahs in that region of Iraq. So, so I, I say all that to say this is that it really made a profound impact on me understanding uh, some of the the the, the wastefulness of, of these long foreign wars, uh, just the, the 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 misplaced faith in nation building. Um, look, we I, I think there's a balance to be had militarily between defending the homeland, taking out evil terrorists who wish us harm when they show themselves. But also not fooling ourselves into believing that we can, you know, turn a, a failed Middle Eastern state into a Jeffersonian parliamentary democracy. Well, and I would imagine you have a lot of thoughts and feelings about how the U.S. pulled out of Afghanistan in light of the fact that you were so recently deployed to Iraq. What what were, what were you thinking as you sort of watched that in August unfold? 
Well, it was very upsetting because, you know, I, I have, you know, many, many uh, former, you know, comrades in arms and people who are still in the military who have served in Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, um, people who were there, uh, you know, till the very end, uh, right there in Kabul. And it was, it was, in, I, I was just enraged as many Americans were to see those images, um, just to see the, just the complete incompetence coming from Joe Biden and his administration, uh, the Joint Chiefs. It was just a complete debacle and it was embarrassing. It offended the honor of this country and of many Americans. And that's, I mean, that was a turning point in Joe Biden's, in, in the first year of his administration. I mean, we, we see it in his poll numbers. We see it in just the way people think about his administration. When the enemies of this country, when they see weakness, they 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 pounce, they move, they seize those opportunities. And that debacle in Afghanistan showed weakness. There are no excuses for it. And the results are 13 dead brave American soldiers, thousands, tens of thousands of civilians, and even U.S. citizens left behind. So so just to kind of circle back a little bit to culture and politics, and you spoke a little bit about this, but I want to give you another chance to talk about culture because obviously – you are preparing, um, and I'm sure you're you're hoping to win. Obviously, be in the Senate. Um, when when you get there, you're going to be dealing with a lot of different issues. When you look out at the landscape right now, particularly at at culture, what is it that most disturbs you? Well, I, I've said this as I've been on the campaign trail around the state of Arkansas and, and around the country in, in national media. There are so many issues that are important right now. But really what's at the core of my campaign, at the core, I believe, of this election cycle right now are just these foundational threshold issues. What kind of a country are we going to be? You know, we're not, this is not the 1980s where, you know, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill are going back and forth about, you know, corporate tax cuts. We have one side that wants to completely destroy, you know, what it means to be an American. We can't, we have one side who believes you know, that they can't even give you a straight answer about what is a man? What is a woman? You know, what is the true history of this country? What is our legacy? You know, what should be the priority of our military? Should it be lethality? Should it be our overall fighting prowess? Or should it be, you know, some of these social justice experiment, experiments? I mean, the, the radical left has taken over so many of our major American institutions. You know, I, I, I think that sports and the military are kind of two of the final frontiers that the radical left are trying to seize right now. But overall, I mean, those are... You know, we have to have real leaders who understand the nature of the fight that we're in. That's part of the reason why I'm on this campaign is because in a deep red state like Arkansas, you know, where, you know, we can really we can afford to send someone who's a conservative warrior to Washington. We've got to have those leaders. And, and to me, that's I think that's, you know, you, we've got to, I, the, the people of Arkansas and the people of Americans, the, the, the people of America, red blooded American patriots. Those are the issues around the dinner table that matter to them. Those are the issues that they're talking about. And unfortunately, for so many years, elected Republicans, they don't reflect those values. They don't fight on those issues that really matter. That has to change. And that's why I'm here. So I want to give you just in our last question here, a little bit of time to talk about the Arkansas fund. You obviously um, have been very busy uh, with your campaign. But before that, during the pandemic, diving into the Arkansas fund, tell us about that, what uh, you're trying to accomplish through that. Yeah, so when I had just left active service in the in the army, I came home to Arkansas, and the first thing I did was I started a nonprofit small business relief fund, uh, kind of like the Barstool Fund, if you, if you recall that. Uh, you know, started that that was a national small business fund. They actually helped a couple of small businesses in Arkansas. That really inspired me to create the Arkansas Fund, which was an Arkansas focused small business relief fund. We helped. 37 mom and pop small businesses. We focused on small businesses that were 10 employees or less, mostly family owned, you know, businesses that re were really struggling due to, you know, the effects of the pandemic, you know, these restrictions, the, you know, the lack of commerce happening, especially businesses that depended, you know, like restaurants that depended on in-person uh, interaction. So these businesses were really hurting. We saw a need, you know, the, the, the people of Arkansas are just so tremendously generous. We were able to raise, uh, over $100,000 relatively quickly. We got that money into the hands of these small business owners and their employees who needed it so desperately. We were able to to keep some businesses afloat. Um, and, you know, luckily the restrictions eased, um, you know, at least during, you know, during those years uh, or, during, you know, earlier in 2021, um, you know, things got back to normal in Arkansas uh, quicker, quicker than most states. 
Um, so we were able to wind down the Arkansas fund. But, you know, we really accomplished our mission. We wanted to raise as much money as we could, as quickly as we could, and get it into the hands of these small business owners, these Arkansas small business owners who needed it. And it was just, it was a tremendous blessing to see the outpouring of support that we had in Arkansas and just the the gratitude from these from these small business owners, these these Arkansans who work so hard to put food on the table, to just do something small to give back to a state that's done so much for me and my family. It was a tremendous blessing. Well, it sounds like an amazing way to give back, and we appreciate your time today. We'll have to have you back sometime soon. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Billy. I appreciate it.